Hello, hackers. Welcome to Hacker 101 iOS Application Basics. In this module, we'll walk through the structure of an iOS application and look at how to perform some basic reconnaissance using freely available tools. We'll focus on static analysis, so you don't need a device to follow along with the exercises. In fact, you can perform these steps on your own using any iOS application. iOS applications are packaged in zip files with an IPA extension. You may also see them referred to as installation packages or iPhone application files. The zip file has a specific structure, a payload folder in the root directory with a .app folder inside that, that usually has the same name as the application. Inside the .app directory, you'll find a file called info.plist that contains application metadata. Since iOS relies on these components during installation, if the structure of the zip file is modified, for instance, if the payload directory is not at the root, the application can't be installed. The .app directory is also called the bundle or bundle directory. This folder and its contents are copied directly to the device during installation. The bundle is signed to prevent tampering at runtime and also contains both the primary application executable and any dependencies or resources required by the application, anything from libraries the application needs to data used by the application on startup. One interesting aspect of the code signature is that it contains what Apple calls entitlements. These correspond to capabilities that the application is requesting, such as the ability to support push notifications or integrate with the user's iCloud storage. Entitlements can be added manually or in Xcode, but require that the corresponding capabilities have been provisioned using the developer's account. Some more invasive capabilities and their corresponding entitlements may require special approval from Apple or may only be granted to Apple's own applications. Let's take a look at an example. As you can see, I have some sample IPA files in my current directory. I'm going to unzip the iGoat Swift IPA in a new directory to keep everything contained. From the file listing, you can see the payload directory at the root, followed by the bundle directory. Using tab completion, we can see that the bundle directory and the app executable have the same name. This is usually the case, but not always. Let's take a look at the entitlements for this app. We can use the Rabin2 tool, which is part of the suite of commands that come with Radare Reverse Engineering Toolkit. We can see that the application identifier is set here with a prefix that matches a team identifier. This application identifier is unique across all apps. This app doesn't have a lot of entitlements, but we can see that it has the keychain access groups entitlement. This indicates that the app may be taking advantage of the keychain feature in iOS to store data securely, but also that it may be sharing the keychain with other apps that have the same team identifier. Another interesting entitlement here is get task allow. This allows another process, say a debugger, to attach to the app. You'll see this in apps that are in development, but you shouldn't encounter it in apps from the App Store since the distribution process should strip this entitlement out. Another place we can look to get an idea of the application's functionality is the info.plist file. This file is in property list format, which is a serialization format you'll frequently encounter on iOS. plist files can be in binary, XML, or a more limited JSON format. The info.plist file contains a number of required metadata values, but can also contain arbitrary configuration information added by the developer. This is one of my first stops when looking at an application. There are a few ways to open a plist file. On a Mac, you can use Xcode or the plutil command with the dash p flag. You can see that plutil prints the plist in a format similar to JSON, or JavaScript object notation. Everything is in a key value format, and there are arrays and dictionaries represented by square brackets and curly brackets, respectively. Near the top of the file, the CF bundle executable key tells us the name of the primary executable. The CF bundle identifier key is set to the unique identifier for the app, and below that, the CF bundle name key is set to the name of the .app directory. If we scroll down a bit, we'll find the version of the app in the CF bundle version key. 
it can also be very helpful to check the value of the minimum OS version key. This enforces the lowest version of iOS that the app will run on without issue. Although you can change this value to install the app on lower versions of iOS, the app may not function correctly if it relies on newer features. Let's take a closer look at the structure of the application executable itself. iOS executables are in Mako format, which has three regions. The header contains metadata about the application, such as the architecture it supports. The load commands describe the structure and layout of the application. You can think of it like a table of contents describing the data in the rest of the file. The data region is organized into segments, which are further divided into sections. Among these segments is the text segment, which contains executable code and is read-only and executable, meaning it cannot alter itself. The data segment is read-write and contains things like uninitialized variables that will be resolved at runtime. Let's see how this looks in an actual executable. I'm using Radare here to load the application using the R2 command and specifying the path to the IPA file with the prefix IPA colon slash slash. Typing ISS displays the segments for the primary executable, including where they are located and their size. You can see that the text segment is marked read only and the data segment is marked read write. Typing IS dumps the sections, and there are a lot of them. Among those, there are some with names related to Swift and Objective-C, two languages that apps are frequently written in. These sections will be important later when we talk about examining the application's APIs. Another interesting characteristic of Mako files is that they can contain multiple executables that target different architectures. This is known as a FAT binary. We can use the rabin2 command to examine the primary executable with the dash A flag. And this shows us that it contains two different architectures, the 32-bit ARM v7 and 64-bit ARM64. We can also use the file command to get the same information. We'll want to extract the architectures into separate files for further analysis, since many tools only operate on a single architecture. This is called thinning the binary. Using the dash X flag with rabin2 will do this for us. One last bit of recon that can be helpful is dumping a list of the libraries and frameworks linked by the application. We can use the dash L flag to print those. From this list, we can get an idea of the functionality to watch for, and we can also see that Swift libraries are included. This is another clue that the application is probably written at least partially in Swift. When you analyze applications from the App Store, you'll encounter an additional complication. App Store apps have encryption applied by Apple prior to publication. This encryption is called FairPlay and is proprietary to Apple. All executables in the IPA file are encrypted. This includes the primary executable as well as executable code in frameworks and libraries. The encrypted portions are decrypted at runtime when the application is launched. When analyzing the primary executable itself, the encryption frustrates the ability to extract useful information from the executables. Remember those load commands? One, called LC Encryption Info 64, indicates whether the executable is encrypted, that's the crypt ID variable, and where the encrypted portion resides, the crypt offset. We can examine this load command to figure out the encryption status of the binary. I'm using the dash I flag of the rabin2 command to print out a variety of information about the file. Among the attributes printed out is the, the crypto attribute, which we can see is false, meaning the file is not encrypted. If we want to get a bit more technical, we can load the IPA file in Radare and use IH to dump the Mako headers and load commands. I've appended a tilde to filter the results by crypt. The crypt offset, crypt size, and crypt ID are all printed. Since the crypt ID is zero, we know the app is not encrypted. Let's take a quick look at an encrypted app's executable. When we run rabin2-i on this file, we see that it is encrypted. Running the strings command will confirm this. I'm using the dash a flag to specify that all sections should be searched for strings, including the text section. If this application was encrypted, we'd expect to eventually see some readable strings when paging through the output. With an encrypted application, what you see here is pretty much what you get.
At this point, you might be wondering how to decrypt an App Store application. At a high level, the process looks like this. First, launch the app, then attach to the running process, and finally dump the decrypted binary from memory. Simple, right? We're essentially letting iOS do the heavy lifting for us and just copying the executable after it's decrypted. There are a number of freely available tools out there that automate this process, but if you want to get a good understanding of how it is done, I recommend looking at a tool called Dump Decrypted. This is a very concise program to dump a single executable, and it will give you a good idea of how the whole process works. For day-to-day -day use, play around with some different tools and find one that works best for you. The bottom line here is that you'll want to ensure you have an unencrypted application to analyze. Remember when we looked at the strings from the text segment of the encrypted binary? There wasn't much usable information there. However, an unencrypted text segment contains a wealth of interesting information that can allow us to identify secrets. For instance, hidden interfaces that are meant for development and debugging, API keys and secrets that aren't intended by the developer to be found, hard-coded passwords, and private keys and other build information that were included by accident. These are frequent targets for bug bounties. Let's start with examining the application's interfaces. Mako binaries are pretty helpful for this purpose. Most iOS applications are written in Objective-C or Swift in whole or in part. In the text segment, there are sections containing Objective-C class and method names and Swift types. These can be used, along with data in other sections, to reconstruct the class definitions. If you don't have access to source code, this can be extremely helpful in understanding the application. We can once again use Rabin2 to perform a simple class dump using the dash cc flag. The output is structured like the definitions and header files and includes the methods that belong to each class. If we want something a bit more in-depth, we can use a tool called dsdump. Using the dash oc flag, we'll dump Objective-C classes in header format with some nice syntax highlighting. You can see that the output is labeled to indicate class versus instance methods and includes properties for classes too. One of the advantages of dsdump is it also will dump Swift classes. For applications that are largely written in Swift, this is very valuable. Use class dumps to better understand the application's functionality and look for interfaces that may not be exposed to the user. You can also look for classes that indicate security protections that could interfere with testing, like jailbreak detection. If we're looking for hard-coded secrets like passwords or sensitive API keys, dumping the strings from the application can be an easy way to get that information without significant reverse engineering effort. If an executable hasn't been stripped of symbols and debugging information, we can also look for clues in the source paths embedded in the binary. These are typically used to output verbose debugging information, but can also disclose usernames and names of libraries that are compiled into the application. If open source intelligence is your specialty, you can try searching for those usernames on public source code repositories like GitHub. Source code repositories can also be useful to identify open source components based on the source code file names. A basic way to dump strings from an executable is using the strings command on Mac or Linux hosts, but I like using Rabin2 with the dash zzq flag because it gives me information about where in the file the string was found. This can come in handy if I'm going to further reverse engineer the application. If we search for the string users in an executable that was not compiled with symbol stripping, which removes debug information from the final file, we'll find the source paths from the machine where the application was built. You can also see in this output that some of the paths appear to have a local username. If this were a real-world application, it would be worth plugging this into GitHub and other source repositories and see if anything interesting turns up. Some other things you can look for include interesting URLs and API endpoints by searching for HTTP, email addresses, and unusual strings that look like passwords or encryption keys. Try searching for error text or messages displayed in the app when you run it and see what other strings appear nearby. When looking for hard-coded secrets, most file types are fair game. 
iOS applications may have data stored in a variety of formats, so it is key to understand how to identify and parse them. In the file system module, we'll see how to interact with several common types of files used by iOS. But to get started, you can easily use shell commands to quickly identify the types of files in the application package. I'm using a combination of shell commands to determine what types of files are present in the bundle directory for iGoat Swift. First, I'm using the find command to find all files starting in the current directory, and then instructing it to run the file command for each. Since the output will contain very long lines, I'm piping it to less with the dash s flag. This prevents it from wrapping the output so it is easier to read. I now have a nicely formatted listing of all the files and their types, if known. It is very handy to write this to a file and use grep to pick out lists of specific types of files, for instance, a list of plist files. Browsing this output will give you a good idea of where to focus your efforts when analyzing the files in the application package. You now know the basics of iOS application packages. Check out our next module on the iOS application file system, where you'll learn about some of the common files that iOS applications store on the file system and how to analyze them to look for sensitive data. Until then, happy hacking!